Hey, let me show you something really cool. Look at this old, old picture. This picture was given to me last, or two summers ago by my aunt who lives in Maryland. And it's a special picture to me and my family. It's taken at a church called Pleasant Valley Church. And it's in Claiborne County, Tennessee, over in a place called Caney Valley. And it's an old picture from 1926. And this is a picture of what they used to have a long time ago called singing schools, singing schools. And they would get all these people together and they'd teach them how to read music. They read shape note music back then. So why is this picture so special to my family? Well, it's because my great grandfather was the teacher of the singing school. And that is him right here, this tall Abraham Lincoln looking guy with a tie on. That's my great grandfather, Peter Elton. So he's in this picture, but not only him, my, my papa and grandma, this guy right here is my dad's dad. And this lady right here is my dad's mom. That's my papa and grandma Helton. This picture from 1926, isn't it amazing? Pictures can really take us back in time. Look how the boys and girls dressed back then. All the girls were in their dresses and most of the men were in black pants and a button up shirt or they're in overalls. A lot of them are wearing ties. I guess because they were at church, we might dress a little bit more like that when we go to church. huh? But this picture was taken in 1926. That church is still there. I just went and saw it a few weeks ago. Uh, and visited visited the place where my where my where my family came from back in the mountains. So this was a cool picture. I'll zoom in. This was let me go to the next slide here. This is close in of my great grandfather. And then it's kind of blurry, but that's my grandfather and grandmother. All the way back from 1926. Pretty wild, huh? <clears throat> but that's what we're going to be talking about this week. We're going to read a story, actually listen to a video of a story this week about old photos. And then we're going to have another story towards the end of the week. This is one of those weeks where there are two stories. And before we listen to our video lesson, video uh, story today, we need to know three, these three words. And so this first word here is curator. Curator. Have you heard that word before? Maybe not. A curator is the person who's in charge of the works of art or objects in a museum. Because my mom is the curator of the exhibit, I was invited to the party. So if you're interested in old photos or works of art, you can study them, take lots of college classes about art and, and things like that. And maybe one day you could be the curator of a museum. You could be in charge of all the art in a museum or exhibits. That would be a fun job, I would think. The second word here is foreground, foreground. The foreground of a picture or a photograph is the area that is closest to the viewer. So if we go back to this, go back to this, the foreground would be the front part of it. And did you notice there's like a little girl here in a little hat in the foreground and she is just sitting and looking at something. She doesn't care her picture's getting made at all. She's in the foreground, what's closest to us in the picture. And then the background of a picture or photograph contains things that are not as noticeable or important as the main objects or the people in the picture or photograph. The poor quality of the photo made it hard to see the background. So the background here would be maybe the church building back here and uh, the things that's back behind it. Not the most important thing here is probably the sign they want us to see. It's kind of hard to read now because it's from a picture from 1926. But the background is the church behind it. The foreground is the people in the front. This girl's in the very front of the picture, isn't she? So those three words are what you need to know for our little video. Curator, person in charge of the exhibits of a museum. Foreground, what's the most important part of the picture in the front that we're looking at. Background are all the things behind it. Okay. Let's Before we get into our story, let's look at some vocabulary uh, we're, let's look at how we can help ourselves when we don't understand a vocabulary word in case we forget <clears throat> or don't know what a word means. So we can monitor and clarify. Monitor means, am I understanding the word I'm reading? 
And clarify means if I don't understand it, what can I do to help me understand the word or maybe the paragraph that I'm reading? And we ask ourselves then, do I understand what I just read? If it's no, here's some clues we're going to look at. If it's yeah, well, then keep on reading. If you understand it, keep on. But if you don't, if you don't understand a word, you could decode it again. What does decode it mean? That means break it down into its parts. Does it have a suffix like we talked about? Does it have an ed or an ing at the end? Um, does it have a prefix like re or something like that at the beginning of it? Can I sound it out knowing what we've learned in spelling and all the different ways words are spelled? Can I sound it out and help me understand the word? Also, we've talked about looking for context clues this year. How is it used in the sentence? Is there any clue in the sentence that would help me understand what this word is? Sometimes you could replace it with another word. If you can think of a word that you think might be a synonym, you might put that word in the blank and see if it makes sense. Or easy thing to do, look it up in a dictionary or glossary. You could just type it in uh, on Google it and it'll, you'll get the meaning of the word. So, uh, these are things we can do when we don't understand a word. When you don't understand part of what you're reading, a section of text, maybe a paragraph or a few sentences, here's some things you can do. You can make some notes about what confuses you. I don't understand what this part says. You can write that out and think about it. Think about what you know, because you're going to understand part of the story. So how does what you don't understand relate to what's before it? What was have what you has what you just read give you some clues about what you might be reading that you don't understand. Here's the biggest thing I do when I don't understand something or maybe I was reading too fast and didn't comprehend it. Go back and reread it. I might read it three or four times. Sometimes when I'm studying for something, I have to read and reread and reread <laughs> to make sure I understand what I'm reading and try to get all the things that the author is trying to say. Reread, look for details you might have missed. And then a lot of times you can look at images or text features. Maybe there's a picture, an illustration on the page that'll help you understand what you're reading. Or maybe there's a, um, a little diagram that'll help you understand what you're reading about. So all of these things we can remember to do when we're reading that helps us either figure out what the word is or figure out what in the world this author just wrote about. And speaking of reading, as we prepare to not read, actually, but prepare to view our informational video, let's look at some things here. So if we talk about a, what genre it is, what kind of story it is, it's an informational video. So it's not a story we read, it's something we watch. Informational videos present facts and information about a topic in visual and audio form. Visual means we're going to see the video. Audio means the sound. Real people and places in the video help vi viewers understand the topic. So there's going to be people talking in the video to help us understand what they're showing us. Informational videos include words that may be specific to a topic. So if we're in a museum, you might see words like curator, or you might hear words if he's showing us a photograph of foreground and background. Producers of videos may include sound effects or music to make the video more interesting for viewers. All right, so you ready to take a look at this video? We got one more little direction before we look at it. It says, as you watch, how can photos take us back in time? Think about conversational format. And that is somebody talking about what we're looking at in the video. Somebody telling us what we're looking at, describing it. How might it help the viewer understand how to analyze historical photographs or how we can look at the photograph and try to decide what it's a photograph of. So listen to them talking helps us understand what we're looking at. How does the conversation help you understand the photographs in the video? Do Kyra and the museum curator help make the topic interesting? All right, so there's some things we can think about as we watch this video, how photos take us back in time. So I'll get it started for us here. <laughs> My name is Kira. I'm 12 years old and I live in Brooklyn. Hi, I'm Jeff. I am the curator of photographs at the Metropolitan Museum and I live in Manhattan. So what are we looking at? What's this photograph of? It's a picture of a Brooklyn Bridge. Where was it? Where do you think it was made from? Was it made from 
uh, Manhattan, from Brooklyn. What do you think? Well, based off of the angle of the photo, I think it was taken maybe on the dock. Well, I think it's in Manhattan, though. I find it interesting how there are still some boats there, even though the bridge was built. So that wouldn't be the main transportation to get across from Manhattan to Brooklyn yeah, or vice versa. You know, what I like is that the, the piers that hold the cables and the cables which hold the bridge are like framing with the river itself, the, uh, the boats, the sailboats. And it's almost like, it's like saying this bridge is doing all of that. It's holding on to all of that, but it's carrying people across it in the air from one place to another. Anyway, I love Brooklyn Bridge and I'm so glad to talk about it with you. So here's another photograph of the Brooklyn Bridge in the collection made by an artist named Berenice Abbott. And we know when it was made, it was 1937. So it was about exactly 50 years after um, the other picture. When you told me about it was exactly 50 years afterwards, did she time it to be exactly during that period? That's interesting. So uh, the photographer, Bernice Abbott, um, was working on a project of photographing old and new New York. And oh, she see. certainly knew that the Brooklyn Bridge was 50 years old when she made this picture. But she was just trying to use the camera to record things as they are. Which is why I felt like it was kind of simple at first. But that's what she was trying to show. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be like that. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like I could walk up and participate in this scene. I feel like I'm walking around uh, New York City in the 1930s. In photography, it brings people back in time in a very nice way. Is that why she would like to take photos of of something as it is, as if she was like building her own city in a way, adding pictures of buildings? and not putting extra details or more props in the area. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And I think that in this photograph, I think she's basically saying that the stuff in the foreground is changing. And what's nice is that in the background, the bridge yeah. isn't. So the bridge would kind of be still a, a reminder of, look, this is still here. We're in New York, right? But everything around it is changing. And will change. Yes. So if someone were to take a photo like this, it could say, oh, look, it's a different time, but it's still in the same place. I'm Kira, and I'm recording from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, that was neat. I enjoyed that. So I think the, the thing they were trying to show is they're using the vocabulary words foreground and background. If you understood what they were saying, that bridge was in both pictures. It was taken 50 years earlier in the first photo they showed us. Then 50 years later in the second photo, the bridge was still there 50 years later, but everything around the bridge had changed a lot. Uh, cities change over time, don't they? So I remember when I was a little boy in Morristown, there was, can you imagine there not even being a mall in Morristown? I remember being here when the mall was being built. My dad and I pulled over on the side of the road and watched the big bulldozers and big dump trucks and things up hauling dirt away where the mall is now. So a lot of things change over time and then some things stay the same, just like that bridge had been there. Well, let's look at our decoding words um, for this week. This week in both in spelling and our decoding lesson for today, we're looking at words that end with long E. And words that end with long E can be spelled, that E sound at the end of them, can be spelled in three different ways. It can be just with a Y, or it can be with an EY, or sometimes it can be an IE. So we'll take a look at our, these words here and pay attention to how the E sound is spelled at the end of the words. Let's first off, let's do it a little different this week. Instead of just going word for word, let's see if first we can find all the words that has the E sound at the end of the word spelled with just a Y. So help me do that. Here we go. Let's go across. There's one. Study. Bubbly. Cuddly. The E sound just a Y. 
uh, juicy, party, quickly, gloomy, happy, and grizzly were the words that I found that ended in just why, but you see they all sound in that they all end in that long e sound. And now let's find the ones that end with an EY at the end. And the first word does galley, mm, pokey, <laughs> trolley, EY, paisley, monkey. Those were the ones I found with an EY. And then it looks like there's a bunch of them with an IE. Eerie, something scary. Sweetie. Is that what you call your boyfriend or girlfriend? Hey, sweetie. Kali. Footsie. What kind of spelling word is that? Footsie. And cookie. I like that one for sure. Cookie. All right, let's look at this sentence here and see if what words we can find with the long E sound at the end. Eduardo stopped to pet a doggy with just the Y spelling at the end before going into the library. Long Y sound at the end. To watch an eerie, i.e., mystery, just a Y, movie, i.e., there's three in a row, eerie, mystery, movie, with creepy Y characters. And those are the kind of spelling words you have this week, words that end with an either an E-Y, an I-E, or just a Y. And so you'll need to pay attention as we practice them this week, which ones end in what way. So we've got turkey, E-Y, lonely, just a Y, galley, E-Y, steady, just a Y, hungry, just a Y, valley has an E-Y, hockey has an E-Y, starry has a Y, melody, just a Y, movie, I-E, don't forget that one, I-E on movie, duty has a Y, Drowsy, just a Y. Chimney is an E-Y. Plenty, just a Y. Daily, just a Y. Alley is an E-Y. Fifty is just a Y. Empty, just a Y. Injury, just a Y. Prairie, now look at the spelling of this word. I always spell this wrong when I'm typing in prairie dog or something. I forget the I before the R, so make sure you look at that. Prairie, P-R-A-I-R-I-E. It's spirit spelled weird, isn't it? There's an I before the R, don't forget that. Colony, into a Y. Eerie, I-E. Angry, just a Y. Melodious, that doesn't end in a Y. Don't worry about that, that's not gonna be on your test. Okay, all right, well, we're gonna do, start working on something and each day this week, we're going to be correcting some sentences. So today you're going to have two things for me to do. Today I want you to take our vocabulary words and just match them up uh, with the correct meaning. Do that for me today. That's just three of them, so that's super easy. The other thing you need to do for me for, I, for ELA today is I'm going to have these five sentences on a Google form, and it's not going to be multiple choice. You're going to have to type in the sentence, okay? So that means that you need to make sure it has a capital letter. You want to make sure it has a capital I. Uh, make sure it has a punctuation at the end. And make sure you correct any spelling that's in the words. All right? So that'll be your two assignments today. Well, I hope you have a good day and go get to work on those things now.